I'm still landing from my trip. And uh, it's going to take quite a long time to readjust. But I have got one or two pictures taken on an extremely expensive camera, which, which Tony lent to me um, to show you at the end of my little talk, uh, which I hope will be helpful to us. Um, so, we're journeying through Lent. We're learning all the time to put into action our Christchurch um, motto, how do we become more fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Good motto. Good, uh, good what's, what do you call it? Snap? Snap line. Very good strap line. Strap line. I'm still learning to speak English again. Very good strap line. Learning to become fully devoted followers, followers of Jesus Christ. A lifetime's journey. A lifetime's learning process. And we're going to be looking together this morning... I've got lots of cracklings and all sorts of things around me, but can you hear me all right? Good. We're going to be looking at the, um, the Israelites' journey through the wilderness, those 40 years of testing that they had. And I'm going to start by just reading this little bit out of the New Testament, which is a reflection of St. Paul's on those years. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 6. He writes... For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they passed through the sea. All passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the wilderness. Now, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. So there's Paul looking back about 1,500 years to the time of the Israelites, his ancestors, that time when they were led by the Lord God through the wilderness and on into the promised land. A critical time of learning. We're traveling together through Lent. We're on a journey too, like they were. We too, like the New Testament church, can learn from their experiences and the mistakes that they made during that journey. Right. But interesting, Paul says it's the same journey um, and the same Christ that they drank from in the wilderness there. We're all on the same journey. Right, now turn, if you would, (coughs) to Exodus chapter 17. That's what we're going to be looking at this morning. Exodus chapter 17. It's about page 72 or something like that. What is it, Nigel? 75. Page 75. Okay, here we go. Just going to read the first half of the chapter to start with. Now, the whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped to Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. 
So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, it is, is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of the Lord. Right. Something must have gone wrong. Something went wrong at this, these two places, Massah and Meribah, that prevented the people of God and Moses himself finding rest. And I want to look with you this morning about what it was that prevented them finding rest and actually prevented Moses from even making it on into the promised land. He never got there. Now, the key event then, the key place name here is Massah and Meribah. This is the name the Jews gave to this event, this happening in their history. They gave names to the places, names which mean something, which are loaded with meaning. Massa means testing. Meribah means quarreling. Now, this event in their history must have become very important. This test that it was carried into the liturgical tradition of Israel. So, we find, therefore, in Psalm 95, which is a psalm of joyful praise, he turns at the end into these words. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah, as you did in that day of Massa in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me. They tried me, though they had seen what I did. For 40 years, I was angry with that generation. I said, these are a people whose hearts go astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Do you see? What happened there in the wilderness when they were tested and when they, they quarreled got transmitted into the worship tradition of the people. So that for centuries and centuries and centuries of this, 106, Psalm 106 and verse 32, here is a psalm all about Israel's history, listing all the important events in Israel's history. And at verse 32 of Psalm 106, we read that famously, of course, was the incident where Beckham was not uh, pulling his weight in the team and not running as much as he should, though he was the fittest man in the, in the place. Uh, Becker, uh, the the you know, chairman, Ferguson, went into the changing room and kicked a, bo a boot and it hit Beckham in the face, and you know, it's part of English football history now, isn't it? But the point I'm making is that that team's success was directly linked to what they to were told was going to happen by their captain. I don't know what your parallel to that is, but for me, for most of my life, it was in the orchestra. You can, or, orchestral musicians moan unbelievably. They grumble about everything under the sun. You, you, know, you just don't want to know. As soon as you put your instrument down, you can speak. and you, you're, There you are in the canteen or in the pub or wherever you are, people start to moan. Right? And uh, you can go back then, after an interval, back for the third act or something, and you can almost hear the effect it's having on the performance. People, the standard is going down, go away on tour for three weeks, and it, like that. But the mature musician is the one who doesn't listen to that. C-R-A-P, doesn't listen to it all, but puts the performance first. That's the mature person. What they, but what is said is often what is believed and what then happens. So, what you see is what you get. Now, 
I've been talking about the people, a little bit about Alex, uh, George, Alex Ferguson. But coming back to the scriptural passage now, uh, the, the commentary on the Exodus passage in the psalm is that Moses didn't enter into the Lord's rest because of the rash words he spoke. He, what he said was what he then got. He didn't find rest, and he didn't even make it into the Lord's, into, into the promised land. So people need to watch out about grumbling, but leaders need to watch out about using rash language in response. Okay. How are we doing? All right? With me? Okay. Let's read on now to what happens next in chapter 17 of the book of Exodus. This is really interesting. Chapter... 17 and verse 8 in the book of Exodus. So they've been grumbling, they've been complaining, and now we read, the Amechalites came out and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amechalites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side and on the other so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered, and make sure that Joshua hears it, because I will completely blot out the name of, of Amalek, Amalek from under the heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Macalites from generation to generation. What the people do is what they get. Yeah? What they say is what they get, but also what they do is what they get. So here you've got a lovely reversal of grumbling. They take the hands of their leader, Moses, who's getting old and frail. They lift him up all day like this. There he is. The battle's going on down in the valley. Joshua's leading the troops forward. And they hold their leader's hands up all day till sunset. And because they do that, they win. What they do is what they get. I want to show you, before I just show you the pictures, I want to tell you um, an experience I had when I was 15. I was uh, in the National Youth Orchestra, big group of young musicians from across the whole country coming together. And uh, there we were, a highly disciplined outfit. And the equivalent of Alex Ferguson was a, a rather plump English lady with an extremely posh voice, and who was very authoritarian, possibly more so than even Alex Ferguson. So this lady got up on, on the rostrum. We were waiting for the conductor to come in. She said, well, boys and girls, today we have a very special conductor who's coming to conduct you all. His name is Rudolf Schwarz. He is a very great musician. But you need to know this before he comes in in just a moment. That in the war, the Nazis sent him to Auschwitz. And because they found out that he was a conductor, Jewish conductor, they broke his arms. So when he comes on, you'll find it very difficult uh, 
to watch his beat some of the time because he can't raise his arms above this height. So you need to be on the edge of your seat, you see. And you need to hold his arms up for him right, and support him through this as he leads you. So she got off the lost woman, and we thought, great, great. So this rather small but electric kind of presence came in, stood on the lost room, and said in a very strong accent that we were going to now rehearse the great C major symphony of Schubert. And up he got, and he was unbelievably strict. So that in the last movement, where, um, he said he, he just could not, he almost lost his temper. At a sort of, we couldn't distinguish triplets between the rhythm. If you're a musician, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah? And he just went on and on about this. But my thought was, we've got to lift his arms up. Because what we do is what we will get. The more we enable this man to give us his musical genius and his interpretation, the more we cooperate with him, the greater the, per the performance is going to be. And it was an electric performance when we come to, came to play that piece. I was only 15 at the time, but all these years later, I think, yeah, we did it. We did it together. We kept a positive spirit and enabled this wonderful piece of music to be realized. We could have moaned, but we didn't. Some pictures, and then I'll sit down. I'm still processing, as I say, what I experienced in Romania. Um, here's my new friend. This is Bobby's brother, his oldest brother. He is the pastor of a church in Romania. His name is Lekatosh. And I stayed in his house for 10 days, really. And his wife looked after me and became like a mother to me gradually. Lekatosh here is in his very humble church. There's the heater. He is a very sick man. He nearly died a year ago. He can only just hold, hold his ministry together. He keeps going, to everybody's amazement, really. The rest of them are quite a lot younger. There he is. Have the next picture. Thanks, Michelle. So there he is, we, we, you know, with the picture. And he wanted to kneel down in front of us. There you can see uh, Bobby and Vasily and some of the other guys there in their little church. Next picture. There's some more of us together with him there. He's sitting next to me. Can you see? And I think the thing that blew me away was that although their leader was a very weak man um, who'd, who'd done a great job getting the church built and continuing to get it sorted, uh, desperate to get some speakers that work, thank God for our speakers here, our system here. Um, but the thing that really impressed me was that they all held him up. They, they lift, held him. He's our leader, our Lekatosh, and we're just going to keep going with him until he, he gets taken up to heaven, you know, and then somebody else can take over. So that, that really blew me away, that, that the sense of unity and love and singleness of purpose in this very humble little church in this Roma site. Can I have the next picture? And then, a bit later, we went up into the mountains. I said to my friends, Bobby and so on, I said, look, I need you to show me the, some, the, the, the lowest level of poverty that you know of. I said, well, we've heard of a place where there is a Roma village in the mountains, in the forest, but we've never really been there. So, well, I want to go there. I want to go and see. So we went off on this drive and took us about half an hour at least to actually find where they were because nobody seemed to really know. And there's in the middle is their leader, Ion uh, Stan. He, they've been living there in this forest for over 200 years. So I said, where, where, where were you before that? So, oh, we don't know. We don't know. But 500 families, so probably at least 2,000 people, living up in medieval conditions in... Um, in, in the forest, 
off the beaten, way off the beaten track. And there's two of his supporters holding him up. Next picture, please, um, Michelle. There he is in his church, right, which is about as big as my living room. And um, the, the church is actually a mud hut. It's only made, it is, it's just held together by mud and, mud and sticks. And this big pipe on the left is their heating system. There's a, a, a furnace in the middle of the room where they put wood. And once again, this very humble man, uh, who probably had an absolute minimum of education, was up, upheld by his people. I shall show you now. So when we had the service, there were, you can't see them all now because they crept in corners and everywhere. There's about 40 of us there in that little church. And something in both these two churches, I felt, although they said, look, we need this and we need this and we need this, something said in, in me very strongly, in a sort of way, I don't want you to have any more stuff. Because I'm really fearful that if you get more stuff and a better building, you might lose something. Because they, in terms of king, the kingdom of God, I felt they had everything. And there was nothing more I could bring them. Because they had love. They supported their leader. They supported each other. And that the intensity of the worship was, was so strong. Next one. Is that it? That's it. Yeah, that's right. So, those are my thoughts for this morning. Um, and um, I think the message is, is simply that what we say to each other is what we ultimately get. What we do is what we get. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. If we grumble, we'll get the product that comes out of grumbling. But if we build each other up in faith, support each other, then we can only move forward. Yeah? That you, you, you actually cannot build a church on grumbling. When, when they grumbled in the wilderness because they hadn't got any, hadn't, didn't have any drink, um, it was a legitimate thing to complain about. It was completely fair. And then they got their drink, didn't they, when Moses hit the rock uh, with the stick and out came the water. They got their drink. But they, they clearly realized that the grumbling and their Moses' rash words had held them back as a community and prevented them from making progress through the wilderness to the promised land. I don't think we're a grumbling community here. But... These words have been recorded, as Paul said. These words, this experience in the wilderness has been recorded as a warning. As a warning to us. When we grumble, we will get the results of that. When we give praise to God and support one another, however bad and difficult the circumstances may ever be, what we say, what we do, is what we will then get. Amen.